That is a little bit uh, less technical um, and a little bit more, well, tips and tricks on some technical terms, but also on mindset and how to become more productive as a developer. So I'm coming up with seven principles that make us more productive as software developers and you know to more if, uh, be more effective in what we're doing to become better at our job. So um, where is oh my computer froze? That is interesting. One second. Huh. Looked like oh another presentation. Okay, let me get rid of this. Okay, now it works. Interesting. Okay, so I'm still the same person um, about me, but another very important uh, detail is missing from this slide, and the important detail is I'm German, right? And this is what we're good at, right? Where Germans are known to be very efficient. So, uh, fun facts about Germany, there is no fun in Germany. <laughs> Go back to work. Okay, yes, I agree. So, uh, let's do this. Let's be more efficient, uh, what we do with German efficiency. And seven principles that make us more productive. And the first principle that I want to start with is embrace automation. Why? Using automation is using the computer in the correct way. Because computers are not very smart. They actually are very dumb. They can only do very stupid things but they can do these things very fast and very reliably. And we humans are not really good at doing something quickly or doing something reliably, right? Humans get bored, humans make erroneous mistakes, humans, you know, have emotions, get angry, whatever. And if I do something for 100 times, there's still a chance that the 101st time I do something wrong, right? With a computer, it's much more reliable and it's much faster. But computers are not really good at thinking or coming up with creative solutions. That is what we are good at. We are humans, especially as developers. So we could, should come up with something, you know, a creative solution and then use automation in a computer to automate and solve it. Right? And automation comes in very big forms, right? like automating some complicated business project, um, like our applications that we write. And automation might also be very small automation shortcuts or hints, especially shortcuts like keyboard shortcuts. So whenever you find them, use shortcuts. And especially with the applications we're using and the applications that we use often, we should be able to, well, embrace the shortcuts and use them as much as possible. So the most important thing is or program that we use a lot is our IDE. So I have an IDE IntelliJ here, but it doesn't matter which one actually. And what I want to show you is just there are many, many forms of automation and small forms of shortcut, uh, shortcuts and we should use them. So for example, when I create a Java class, oh, how did I create this? Oh, well, there was already some, you know, shortcut. I said, you know, new Java class and I am in a certain package. So my IDE says, okay, I create this in this class, uh, in this package already. Again, this is Java specific, but you know all Java. It doesn't even matter about Java. It's, you know, programming in general. That is automation to create this faster. Another example, if I say, oh, what was that? Public, static, void, main, string, args, right? So the only thing that enables me is these shortcuts just get rid of all the typing myself. I can say, I can write time in public, static, void, main, string. I can also write it this way, right? And then I can write this myself, but it takes like five seconds. And it's just faster to use some shortcut and it's more reliable. It doesn't make that much mistakes. Another example, I create some, um, hello, some system out, like do this or do that or do, um, I don't know, something else. And assuming I have some code, I want to refactor this code now. I want to put these two lines into one method and this line into one method, right? So what I do, of course, I write some uh, private method, right? It has to be static, private, static, void, do this and that. And I include this and then I, of course, go and copy paste the code down there, right, right here. And then I must not forget to call the method actually, do this and that, and then I refactored it, right. But of course, there is an IDE feature for that, right. There are refactoring features and shortcuts to make that faster and especially more reliable. Because if I forget to call this method, right, then there's a bug already. And 
let's make this, uh, let's return this. So there is a refactoring feature, and this is just one example. If I go right click, refactor, extract method, I can extract the method of these two lines of code and say do this and that. And this is faster, and it does not forget to call the method actually, right? So it's just helpful here. And then, of course, if I say I do this now 10 times, and after 10 times, I'm just tired of right-click, refactor, extract, method. And then I see, oh, there's also a shortcut I can, I can type. Control, Alt, M. And then I say, okay, do this and that, and this is just faster. And the same for the other thing, Control, Alt, M, do something else. And I can get, uh, get to the results faster. And then my IDE is also very intelligent and say, if you would change the signature, then I can also get... Uh, yeah, I don't care. And it's just faster to use automation, especially it's more reliable. And another very help, so there are many, many refactoring features in your IDE. It doesn't matter which IDE you're using and just trying to get more familiar with them, right? You can extract super classes. You can change the you know, abstraction level of class hierarchies and things like that. You can introduce delegation, replace... Um, uh, replace inheritance with delegation in, um, in IntelliJ, so many, many things that are helpful. Um, is there a comment? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's no matter what ID, if it's ID from JetBrains. <laughs> oh, yeah, I agree. I'm not sponsored by JetBrains, but definitely IntelliJ is my, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the biggest fan of that IDE, but you know, any IDE has these features, to be fair. It doesn't even have to be Java, but it helps, of course. And another thing that in IntelliJ is called live templates, this is what I showed um, before is just creating code quicker. So I did this for public static void main, right, to create this um, method faster. You can also say, you know, something like uh, method, void method. Uh, no, not void method, what is the name? Yeah, I should know this. Um, hello? Oh. Public static void. Yeah, something like this string method, and then, you know, you can create some method easier. But these come out of the box with your um, IDE, but the important thing is you can create them yourself. <clears throat> so, for example, I use a lot of Enterprise Java, and many times I write something like this, add inject, right? I add inject some bean. So, in this case, I just, I could write, you know, add inject and then select the correct import, but this already takes, you know, a few seconds, and it especially takes some mental energy to correct to select the correct uh, import. And if I just want to, you know, it should be stupid. Just add inject because I always add inject, and then I create. Well, I create some live template myself to add inject some bean, or even to um, add inject an event of something. It's just easier, and it already injects the correct import as well here. So I created this live template that uh, just does this faster for me. Same with, how many times did I write at persistent context entity manager, entity manager? It just is faster if I use a live template for that, right? Or managed executor service. If you use Spring at AutoWire, same thing. If you use any other framework or technology, there is a lot of boilerplate code that you keep typing yourself over and over again that you can create templates for. Same with uh, post construct method, right? In it, this and that, or pre destroy method, or if we're in a test case, right? You can write a test um, here. I don't have to import right now. And, you know, whatever you do, there might be a faster way to do that. You can identify these code patterns and just define a, an, uh, define a template for that to get there faster. Who of you knows the YAML file format and specifically Docker or Kubernetes? Hands up. Okay, a few of you. Uh, Kubernetes. YAML. Who of you can write um, a Kubernetes deployment YAML from scratch out of your head like this? You? You can? Okay. You read the documentation by heart? Oh, that's good. I approve. Well, I can't, as you can see. So I created a template for it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you can you know, fill in some details. This might be a hello service or hello world, uh, if I can type, right? And it's just much easier and more reliable to define it this way, to use a template that you've defined yourself. So even if they don't come out of the box, you can define your own templates and then just be faster by doing that. And all of that is <clears throat> an example for using shortcuts in your application to do a specific thing just faster, right? Because it uses automation in this case. 
And that is just you know, very helpful. You can become a power user of whatever you do. Typically that's the IDE and then you get much uh, more, more quicker than that. Especially IntelliJ has so many more features than I even know about. Um, with all of these live templates and surround with and, and stuff like that, you can get very, very quickly there. Another thing that is a great enabler for automation is the command line. Especially if you're on a Unix-based operating system and on Linux, what I use, you can use the command line for almost everything that you, uh, that you do. So, a few things about a command line here. That's my command line. And now, I'm a big fan of the command line, I have to say. And in the next minutes, I'll tell you why. Um, just to get started, who of you uses uh, Bash? Okay, quite a few. Who of you uses a different uh, shell, like for example, Z shell? Nice. So I use Z shell in this case, and I don't want to be too religious what, what to use, but I challenge you to give Z shell a try. Why? Many features and many reasons actually, it's more powerful, but just because of two features that you will like. First feature is, and this sounds small, but trust me, first feature is you can change directories without typing CD. Yeah, I know, it sounds like a small improvement, but once you get used to say something like temp slash test project and just hit this without CD, then you will never uh, go back just because it's so much easier. But I know, the second feature, which is even more helpful, you can auto expand multiple directory hierarchies with hitting tab once. So instead of saying I go to home directory, workspaces, tab, Sebastian National tab, uh, modern enterprise Java tab, uh, source tab, main tab, Java tab. Instead, I say I go to workspaces, Sebastian National, modern enterprise Java, source main Java, I hit tab once and it auto expands everything and I hit enter and then I'm there. And once you get used to this, trust me, you never want to go back to, to bash. And then, you know, if you watch colleagues doing this, cd dot dot, cd dot dot, right? This is what, what we typically see in projects, what colleagues say, oh, I'm almost there, and now I go back to cd mod and this, cd source, cd main, right? This is how people usually use the command line, which is probably not the most efficient way. So you might have a look at that. And another thing that is very, very helpful in the command line is aliases. Shell alias is a great enabler just to be quicker. Again, that's a form of automation. So what is a shell alias? Um, typically what you use the command line for is you do something like, you know, maven, right? Like maven clean package or maven package or maven clean install, right? And you type this all over again and to build your project. But what if I tell you there's a faster way to write it by just defining an, a template, something like maven clean install? or uh, Maven clean package, you know, to define a shell alias, or I don't know, just Maven package, or actually, if we're honest, we type this, right? Maven clean package and skip the test. That's what we execute. But whatever you keep typing yourself, there's probably a faster way to do it, right? So I also use git on the command line. And if you type git status or git commit many, many times, there's a faster way to just say, okay, git status or git commit, or git uh, push and pull, right, with rebase and then push it again to the origin in the current branch, or git push just with the current branch, and things like that. Whatever you do, you can define an alias with, you know, that you don't have to type your commands all over again, right? If you use docker, how many times do you write docker build dash t, or, you know, docker push, or docker ps, right? Many, many times you type this all over, or cube control, right? Kube control apply. If you use Kubernetes, I asked before, kube control get pods, kube control get services. It's just faster to define aliases to be there quicker. I could go on for two hours. I, I defined many, many aliases because now I use the command line for basically everything. And this is a huge enabler to just get there faster. And another thing is um, that you can do on the command line is um, other shortcuts. So you can define and script that. Um, if you're more interested in, in that, I can point you uh, to a video course to see this. But basically, if you believe it or not, I now use the command line for everything. I don't even use a file explorer anymore. So, I, no kidding, I use the command line to you know, move and copy files around and things like that. You can define um, some shortcuts. So, for example, you probably know um, clear. Instead of clear, you can do command L, right? 
And then you can also define something like command K for displaying the current directory or display the current directory with a hierarchy or more hierarchy, right? And just switch that, that you see, okay, what is there in the active directory? And it's just so much faster than, you know, using your mouse and clicking around in an explorer and just doing this. I don't know. It enables you to do, uh, to do more things. You can insert, I don't know, current date or stuff like that. You can define uh, shortcuts for whatever you like. More about automation. Of course, if you're on the command line, big enabler is bash scripts, right, shell scripts. Because that's also very easy to define, if you use a command line to, in, you know, to execute certain commands, automating them is super easy. You just take the uh, commands, put it into a file, make it executable, and then you're done. Right? Do something like, how do I create my project or build my project? Well, you can create a script, build and run my project. I can write something like, how do I write my project? Now I actually have to type Maven clean package, build, whatever, right? This is a Java and Maven application, let's say. Let's say Maven clean package, docker build, something in, uh, to temp, then docker run, dash p, 8080, I don't know, something like this, right? You can just define this <clears throat> as a shell script and then execute it, right? That's how you automate on a command line. And then it will execute these commands and then you don't even have to um, type the aliases anymore. That's the easiest way to automate stuff if you use the shell. And talking about automation, you can basically put, you can automate everything if you, if you put everything as code, right? If we think about it. An application that performs some business logic to execute some use cases, well, you write some code for it, right? So it will be automated so your code is actually executed, right? The same can be done with, so that is code as code, it's quite obvious. Same can be done with configuration as code. So you can put in your server configuration or whatever into XML, into properties files, into YAML or JSON, something else. So it can be stored as code and it can be read by uh, machines. And you can put it into version control. It's, you know, it's uh, maintainable. It's there. You can identify all the changes you made. It's there as code. That is helpful. You're enabled to do automation. Infrastructure as code, if you think of things like Docker, Docker files, Kubernetes, YAML, that is infrastructure as code, you define as code the target state of whatever, you know, your application, your something might look like. And actually you can put everything as code if you think about it. You can put documentation as code with plain text documentation formats like Markdown, ASCII doc that you can then process into HTML, PDF, whatever. You can put your installation as shell scripts into code and just make that faster. When I bought this laptop, um, setting it up took me like 15 minutes, including all applications, including all configuration and everything, because, well, automation, you write shell scripts, right? You point it to your .files repository, you can get that from Git. You point it to all the um, um, Linux package manager installation, right? Pacman, install this, install that, or yum, or apt-get, right? And it just runs, uh, runs through and you can drink your coffee while you do this just automation, then a computer will install it for you. And if you think about it, you can basically automate and codify everything. That's a good principle to follow, three-strike principle. So when we see something, when we see some manual task or something we have to execute ourselves as a human, well, the first time we do it, right, it's just a manual task, first time, whatever, we just do it. The second time we have to do the same task in the same way, we get a little bit annoyed, right? This is like, ah, oh, this should be automated, but we still do it. And then the third time we say, oh, yet. We don't do it. I don't do it anymore. I will write some automation that does the task. And then the fourth time, fifth time, sixth time, you save some time, it's automated, it's more reliable, and you don't have to do it anymore as a human. And you can basically automate, you know, everything. There's this funny uh, story that went around on the internet of, uh, it was actually a Russian, hacker slash system administrator who automated every part of his job, like literally everything that involved his work. I don't know if you, um, if you heard about the story, including some, you know, if some customer wrote him an email that says, oh, we screwed up the, you know, database again, then there was some trigger on, you know, some keywords, then some script automatically locked into uh, the database production server and restored the last backup and wrote him a message back. Yeah, no worries. We fixed it. Thank you. And things like that. And including some, um, you know, messages to his wife. So when it was uh, after, I don't know, 6 p.m., then automatically it came with a random excuse like, oh, it's a lot of traffic here and I'm sorry I'm late, but I'll be there soon and things like that. 
might be a little bit dangerous, but you know, this might give you an inspiration. You can basically automate whatever recurring task you might have in your, as part of your job. Just try to be creative and you know, you can automate whatever you think of. If we talk about tests, uh, we had that before. <clears throat> tests, of course, should also be automated, but not only should they be executed in an automated way, but also verify in an automated way, right? So the test should themselves already tell us whether something is valid or not, right? And again, this can be very creative. So if you write some GUI applications, you can, you know, take some screenshots and automatically compare them. You can compare some video of some GUI application, whether that looks correctly. Um, the test should tell you, you know, binary status, red or green, and you not, must not be um, um, enabled or you do not have to, should not um, need to look into the test whether it's valid or not. And if we take that further, we end up with continuous delivery, right? How do we deliver our software? How do we deploy our software? Well, in this well-defined, fully automated approach in our uh, CICD pipeline that executes it for us, including the tests, including the verification, the automated verification that something works. So if it goes through the pipeline and it's green, we can just deploy it right away to production. Right? That would be the ideal goal automating their everything, especially automating the verification and the testing. Quite a hard um, goal to achieve in the beginning, but once we are there, especially with the testing part and the test coverage, then it really enables us to move fast because then we don't need to uh, spend or waste time with deployments or with any risky processes because it's much more reliable to have an automation doing that and we can just you know, focus on implementing features, refactoring, deploying again, deploying again, and there's the reliability and the quality being built in by this automation here. Next principle, principle two, focus and eliminate context switches. So as a human, we need to focus on one thing and eliminate all the context switches that we have. You probably know that processors, CPUs, have you know, a context switches when they switch the process and they have a penalty to pay because of their execution pipeline, if they switch the process, so they have to clear the pipeline of the um, uh, commands and things like that, and it, it takes a few, um, a few cycles. Humans have a much, much bigger penalty to pay when we switch our context, our mental context of, I work on this thing, and now I think about that thing. Multitasking is a lie, right? We, humans do not multitask, especially as, um, or at least not at things where they have to think about. Totally, you can drive your car and, you know, write a message. You should not do this, but you can, because driving your car, it's a habit, right? You don't have to think about it. Once you did it 100 times, you know, then it doesn't require much mental energy. But programming and coming up with complex solution, it requires mental energy. It requires you to think. It's not just, you know, a habit, oh, I write code every day. No, you have to look at what you're writing. You have to think about it. So it does not work to, you know, focus on multiple things, and you have to be able to eliminate your you know, eliminate these context switches. And again, context switches come in big forms, like a coworker distru uh, disturbing you, and also come in small forms. Even things like, you know, hand movements are context switches up to a small form. And that's why, if you want to be productive, take your mouse, if you have one, I don't even have one, and throw it away. You don't need it. Don't even look at it anymore. Use your keyboard. That's what we developers should care about. Increase your keyboard usage. Why? Because mostly of context switches. You're not context switching, you know, your hand movements from here to there, or it's just slow to move your hand and your mouse around. You're just much faster by typing on the key. And typically we developers know this, right? We just, it's so much faster to type things on a, on a keyboard. We have many more fingers available and keys. And we should increase that. And on the same term, if you type a lot, you might want to get a proper keyboard. So that's what I care um, about as well. So <laughs> somebody's shaking their head. Mm -hmm. uh, like different 
Like yeah, I, I kind of I kind of agree. So I think we come to a similar conclusion. But but first of all, my point is, <coughs> sorry, if you type a lot, and as a programmer you should type a lot, then you get a, should get a proper device, one that works for you. It might include an, an ergonomic layout. We we'll talk about layouts and actually um, context switches in a second. But just about the switch in general and the device in general, you should care about the proper quality. And I don't want to make any advertising, that's just what I used before. Uh, das Keyboard has a German name, but it's actually an American brand of a, a keyboard with cherry switches, cherry blue or cherry brown or a few others. If you like your co-workers, don't use the cherry blue switches because they're very clicky and loud. Um, I like the cherry brew, brown um, ones. Actually, I now use this one. Real Force Topper, um, that's a Japanese brand with capacitive switches, has a very nice uh, typing experience as well. But anyway, whatever you use, just use you know a proper quality keyboard that already makes a big difference, and then just try out you know whatever switches or what is a nice typing feeling for you. It will make a huge difference, especially if you type on these MacBook. Well, that's all, that's my personal rant uh, on these pretty bad uh, keyboards. Uh, anyway. So that is one thing, and this, I think, as far as I know, doesn't affect you that much. Keyboard layouts, because if you switch, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if you switch the Russian keyboard layout to the English one, you get the US one with the, um, with the special characters in the correct um, way, right? So you can type the special characters like the curly braces easily, right? Um, if not, you might think about switching to the... Um, English keyboard layout, so that's what I did. I don't use the German anymore because in a German keyboard layout, you don't see, you see it black here, you don't have the curly braces and the special characters, but you have to type all graphics with, for the special characters. And I want to actually have it the other way around, that I can type the special characters easily because I'm a programmer, I need them all the time. And then if I once in a while type this, you know, umlaut, then I have to use all graphics, which is fine. But of course, you deal with two keyboard layouts all the time, right, if you switch to to Russian, that's of course different. Um, so that might not uh, affect you. At least you should have one keyboard layout where you can type these special characters easily. So that's the important thing. Now about um, context switches on the typing. And that might go a little bit into the same direction what you were asking. Let me t uh, tell you a little bit about Vim way of typing or Vim editor. So that is one thing I started using four years, almost five years ago the Vim editor, why? I don't care about the editor at all. So a lot of people you know, uh, rant about this and that's the editor that nobody knows how to exit. Um, but, right, but, right, that's uh, what everybody knows and there's a reason for that, why? So this editor is built around a very important thing, I believe that is the concept of eliminating the context switches of the movements of your hands by staying on the home row. You should be able to you know, keep your hands there where they're supposed to be, that is, F and J normal keyboard layout, right? And they should stay there. They should now, you know, not move to the cursor or to all graphics or to whatever. You should stay there where you are. And in a normal editor, this only works if you have multiple layers, if you overload the keys. And that's the reason why everybody's so confused with this editor, because initially you cannot type. You have to type a special character like I for insert, and only then you can type. And normally you are in what is called the normal mode and then you can move around actually. So instead of using the cursors, you can see it on the, top, uh, on the bottom right, I'm using you know, H and L and uh, J and K to move around and I can combine this movement with actions. So that's the second principle, I have composable actions. So for example, I can say substitute, like substitute a character or substitute um, for example, a word or substitute a movement, like for example, move one word forward, move one word back forward, or substitute, you know, one word forward to have goodbye instead of hello, and then, you know, repeat that action, repeat that action, and you can just like be um, very quick of, you know, composing action with movement commands, because, you know, you, you get this composability. And if you combine this with just moving around without changing your hand position, you can get very, very quick because you don't have to look at the keyboard. You don't have to you know, go from here down to the cursor uh, arrow keys and back. You just always um, are on the same position. And once you get used to all of these keys, I know that's a very steep learning curve, but once you, know, you are good enough, then you will be just much, much faster 
than in any other editor because you have more layers of typing available without switching your hands, without switching your hand position. So um, you can use uh, this and then, you know, there are a few other concepts that are helpful. So for example, I use this relative line numbering that looks a little bit weird here on the left. The reason for that is the movement commands. So for example, if I want to move up here, I can just say that's relative three up. So I can say three lines up and then I'm there. Or, you know, down here I can say, okay, seven lines down and I can just jump there without, you know, going up, 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 up or without using my mouse to get there. You can just, you know, you can get very, very quickly with a few um, concepts here. So you might have a look at not even the editor, but just this whim way of typing or whim way of thinking, um, how I think about it. There are some tutorials out there that can explain this much better than I can. But the context switch or the you know, concept of getting rid of these context switches is, I think, uh, one of the most important things. And then, of course, we get, once you get used to this, you want to vimify your whole environment just because it's faster. So you probably saw I use my IDE in the same weird uh, movement. There are um, Vim emulation plugins for all of the IDEs available. So that's IdeaVim. Same story. You can even Vimify your browser if you want. So let's go to a website here and then I can, you know, Vimify this here and I can even, you know, go to some links um, by just typing some, some characters that come as an overlay without moving my hands to a mouse. It's a question whether a website is then faster to be um, used with your mouse and sometimes I just switch to the mouse and then it's just one context switch and back. But if I just keep typing all over again and then for a small movement, I don't have to, I don't have to do that uh, context switch. So, you know, that is just a concept that I think is um, easier than or more effective to use. Oh, and by the way, you can also um, vimify your command line. So I use this for uh, Z shell as well, right? And you can do this, the Vim mode. And what is um, especially helpful, you can jump then here, you know, and just say, for example, oh, delete everything here without, you know, using your backspace, which is just much slower. So you can, for example, I don't know, uh, jump around there and then say, okay, go to the beginning here and then delete everything from there. Just by these jump commands, you're so much faster with using the commands in your command line here. Another thing for especially um, the focus part is that as a human, you should keep these turnaround cycles short. Why? Programming is very much a you know, flow experience. So you want immediate feedback and you want the notification whether whatever you do works. Right? That's the definition of you know, being in the flow of whatever you're doing. Right? I write something, I create some code, and then I want the feedback whether or not that works. Right? I could run my application, I could execute a test, but it has to be fast. Why? Well, you know, what happens as a human? I get bored easily. That's also a good uh, pointer for later on. You heard that notification. Um, I get bored, you see, another distraction. I wanted to say something and now I get distracted. We come to that in a second. As a human, I get bored easily. So for example, if I say, I have another example here, this uses coffee. This uses an, an application that's an enterprise job application that uses Quarkus. Um, that's a new cloud-native Java framework, but anyway, if I say, okay, I write some code that does an HTML, you know, Jack's REST resource here that creates some coffee, and now I wrote this super complex code, and now I want to test it. So what happens? Well, I go and say Docker, build, create, run, and then it starts up. And it takes 20 seconds, and I'm a human, right? So I don't look at this 20 seconds, no. Of course, I look into my smartphone, and I check Telegram, WhatsApp, Instagram, right? And then I get distracted and, oh, there's this important Slack notification message. And then I reply and now my flow and my focus is totally gone. I even forgot about this coffee, right? I'm somewhere else in Slack. And that doesn't work well. So in order to have this fast feedback loop, in order to stay in my flow mode, I need immediate feedback. And immediate feedback at ideally in two seconds or in less. So if I have something here, I want that to execute quickly. And this is actually what this development mode of this Quarkus technology is. So this is very specific to Enterprise Java, but I can show you a very cool thing about this. It uses some, well, black magic and uh, some mechanisms to hot swap code. So I can say, hey, I can run my application. And then I say, you know, curl localhost 8080, by the way, another shell alias, uh, coffee to access my application, right? So I now get my hello world coffee response, great. It was quite quick. 
So, you know, flow experience, pretty good. But now the point is, if I change something, right, I change coffee to coffee exclamation mark, then I need to rebuild and redeploy something that takes time and it's just slow. Unless I use a technology that enables me to change that quickly. So that is a development mode that updates whatever I'm doing here in, well, half a second. Less than a second. This is a very specific example to this Quarkus stuff. There are other frameworks that can do a similar thing. The point is, I want to create a development environment that just enables me to get this fast feedback. If I do some action, if I write some code, if I write some test, and then the response comes in more than five seconds, that's too slow. That will get you out of your focus. You will be distracted, you check your emails, you do something else, and you get out of your flow experience. So I have a rule um, for coffee. If you perform an action, whatever, start a test, do a deployment, if you take your coffee, you drink your coffee, and you put it down, then it has to be finished. If it takes longer than that, it's too slow. You have to change it. Because then, you know, then I get distracted. If it's still not done, okay, now I check my emails, right? So that is the important thing. And um, what this just enables me to do is to stay in that feedback mode, to just say, okay, I changed something in the code. Okay, I changed the environment now. Let's execute, um, I don't know, a system test here. Let's see whether coffee is coffee, actually. And the system test, now my IDE is sleeping, should execute this immediately as well. And then it says, oh, no, it's not coffee. It's coffee exclamation mark. Okay, let's change the test. And now run it again. And then, you know, immediately, my IDE is a little bit slow, maybe because of the presentation mode here or something. But immediately, this was like uh, two seconds, I need this feedback whether it works or not. <clears throat> If I start the test and if I have to wait even 10 seconds, that's too slow. I get distracted. So keep these turnaround cycles short. So I can, I can show this again. I can change my code here, coffee, coffee dot, and I want to see the changes immediately. That is very important just to you know, not get distracted. So this is a, an interesting technology, Quarkus, if you want to uh, check this out, quarkus.io for Enterprise Java. But in general, that's available for many technologies, such a um, development mode where you get the fast feedback for the immediate feedback to stay in this flow experience. More about distractions. So that is not a joke. I actually purchased some, uh, some of these. I also purchased some earplugs. Why? There are tons of distractions out there in this world that we need to manage in order to focus, right? And there are many, many different distractions and it depends from human to, to human what distracts you. So I get distracted a lot by noise. So, you know, if somebody's like talking, especially a language that I understand, then, you know, this always kind of distracts me whether I want or not. It helps a lot to, you know, have one of these ear earplugs or noise cancelling headphones also helps uh, uh, me a lot. Um, and there's also the concept of visual noise. So if you sit somewhere and there are always, you know, people passing by, it's also kind of distracted because, you know, you, you see something moving there and you can just try to manage and get rid of all of these distractions had a, a phone notification uh, before. That is probably the worst invention for human productivity ever made, a smartphone, especially if you have all of the notifications like emails, Slack, WhatsApp, Telegram. Very, very bad because it just distracts you. Even if it's a message, you, re you kind of see the message. Oh, and even if you think it's not important now, just that you read it and that you, you know, clicked away the notification cost you a lot of, you know, that focus energy. You lost a lot of your focus by doing that. So for emails and Slack and everything, there is a very easy solution to that. When you're working and when you're trying to focus and get something done, close email, close Slack, close any other application that you have there, any notification on your computer. Every phone, iPhone and Android, has a pretty good feature that enables you to focus more. It's called flight mode. Guaranteed you won't get any distractions and I'm not kidding, this is very important and helpful feature to just being, uh, enable you to focus. There is some psychology science. If, if you put your phone on the table while you do something else or while you're having a conversation, if you put it on the table either like this or like this, or if it's even switched off, it will distract you and it will cost mental energy. Even if it's just laying there, power off, it will cost you some energy because you think about it, yeah, and you might have some task or you might have some, you know, to call somebody or whatever and put it on flight mode into your pocket, away, and then afterwards you can check it again. 
So I can easily say that I work remotely, but even if you work you know, in an office or with coworkers in a team, at least you should be able to communicate with each other, to talk to each other, to say, this is an important topic and I want to get something done. And give me at least 30 minutes or an hour where I will be offline, where I will be not available on Slack or email because I need to get something done. I need to implement this thing here and I want to be able to focus. Right? And that usually works very well in projects if you say, hey, give me a, a window of 30 minutes, 60 minutes where I will you know, return to you, come back to you within 60 minutes or within 30 minutes. Mostly that's fine. And then, you know, I open up email and Slack and reply to you a super important message. And then I close it again after five minutes and I'm in focus mode again, right? So this works and then you are kind of responsive, not immediately, but mostly good enough um, except emergencies and you are able to focus. So that is very important. This is also important work environments. Um, that picture was taken in Japan and a beautiful countryside in the Itsu Peninsula where we organized an unconference for, for Java. And this sounds, you know, it looks very nice like vacation and it's also a very nice environment. But believe it or not, such environments, if you work uh, in a place like that, just for four hours a day, it's much more productive and effective than working eight hours in a noisy and distracting office, right? It does make a big difference for human beings, whether you have a peaceful, quiet nature environment where you can relax, where you have peace, in mind, peace of mind, it's much easier to get something done rather than, you know, if you have a lot of distractions around. There is some, um, there is some science and there is some importance to that, especially if you have the ability to work, you know, remotely or in Inupolis if you work here, that's also, I think, a very quiet and uh, good place to just be able to focus rather than in a noisy uh, city, something like that. It does make a difference. Here's a nice cartoon that I like. Uh, we have to develop a dude uh, uh, up there that tries to you know, focus and solve some problems. So we have a decision tree over there and huh, what if I put something here and like this? And then of course the coworker comes, hey, do you have one second? And what happens, poof, everything is gone, right? Everything that you built up in your temporary working memory is then gone and you're lost in space. You ask yourself, what, what was I doing? And of course the other person says, oh, <laughs> Never mind, it was actually not that important. But you totally lost your, concept, uh, your context, you totally lost you know, whatever you were working on. It will take a lot of time to build that up again, your temporary working memory, and this is where bugs happen. Because you know, that important side effect case that you just were thinking about in your temporary memory storage and you were just about to implement that corner case, you just forgot about it and you will forget about it then and then you know, you, just put in some bug because somebody distracted you. So it's important to, you know, being able to focus and get stuff done there. Um, working environments, I um, can say this again, just because that is my environment that I work in. This is not a specific uh, presentation mode, that's my actual setup. You see some small little taskbar down there. Other than that, that's my setup that I use. I use uh, Linux with an i3 tiling window manager. Uh, that is just very nice because most of it it's in full screen mode. I have one um, picture like this or like this, what I want to focus on and that's it. And I have no notifications, nothing else, no other popping window that just enables me to focus a lot. I think that's just an interesting thing to do. Okay, next principle. Principle three. I said this before. Every once in a while, try to take a, take a step back and reflect and see what am I doing the whole day, right? So ask yourself that, important question. And then you might identify a few tasks or a few things that you keep doing that might be optimized somehow, right? So you might identify a task that you always do manually that could be automated. It might be a shortcut, one that you can define yourself. You might identify, oh, every morning when I come into the office, I always open up you know, my browser and the IDE and my email program and my browser and all these three tabs. Well, you can automate that, right? You can automate whatever you want in your, in your computer if you're creative and then you save time. Even if it's just small things, it's not even about the time, it's more the mental energy that you need to invest if you do some tasks yourself. So that's, that's an important thing. And all of these things are somewhat long-term investments, right? 
Every automation you write, every shortcuts you define or learn, every testing you define, every tooling that you can improve, next time it will just be you know, more effective and just faster to use. And again, more important, you save a lot of mental energy by not doing it yourself. That's another fun principle, the principle of don't make me think, or at least not don't make me think twice. So every time when you have this you know, deja vu moment, where you say, oh, I've solved that problem before. I've done that before, but how does it work again or something like that, right? So how again do I deploy to, I don't know, my test environment? And I've solved this two weeks ago, but I cannot remember. So, you know, we should have documented it or something like that. Well, you should solve a problem. If you solve it then only once and, you know, think about it, like how to deploy to my, I don't know, test environment and then, you know, document it or better automate it. So define some processes that you know, can come up with how do I deploy to this um, environment, you know, something like inbox zero uh, for your emails is also just a process, right? Like if uh, I'm replying that email takes less than two minutes and I do it here or I move it to that folder or this or that, right? You define processes that you do that you then can automate or at least document. And automation can be a form or is a form of documentation, right? That you can also save then, right? So how do I deploy to my test environment? Well, look into the script, it's right there. So this is the description of you know, how you deploy there, things like that. So this, this helps you and you solve this problem once, you can document or automate it and then you know, next time you can just execute this and you don't have to you know, remind yourself and do this hard thinking uh, all over again. I noticed this myself many times, like you know, how to deploy this or that, how to create the SSL certificates for, um, for a specific domain and you, know, you can automate or at least uh, document that more properly if you do that investment once. That's another thing to keep a to-do list. No, really, yes. It sounds very obvious, Captain Obvious, to keep a to-do list. Why? Well, you don't have to think about stuff because I believe the human brain is not a storage unit. It's a processing unit and if you say, oh, I must not forget to do this super important thing. It requires mental energy to think that, right? To not forget something, to remember something. And if you instead can put it into a to-do list, then you have the peace of mind because it's there. You can look at it later if you want and you don't have to remember it. Now, there's a few things to to-do lists. Um, part of my career, I wrote, I think, at least three to-do list applications myself. Right? That's something we do as developers. First of all, we write a to-do list application because it's much better than all of the other ones. Um, there's actually one that I still use, but anyway. There's a very easy, um, easier way even to say, okay, how to manage your to-dos. It doesn't matter which application you use. It's much more about the process and the principles that you use. It can be as simple as, well, I write some, I don't know, text file. You saw the shortcut yeah, for the date? Okay. It can be simple as a text file or, you know, ask a doc to say, okay, what are my, I don't know, to do's for the day. And then, you know, I have to do this and do that. So a few takeaways that help me, um, always helpful to prioritize your to-do list, right? Like put um, uh, the most important thing on the top and then, you know, start with the most important thing. And each day or each week or each sprint cycle or whatever, um, you know, terms you think in, start with a clean state, right? Like start with an empty paper, start with an empty list and say, okay, what are the most important things? Because it forces you to think about, you know, what is really important. And then you don't have to do lists with, you know, hundred things of, uh, that need to be done that you always just copy from A to B and, you know, you never get done anything. Why? Well, it um, requires a lot of energy to even look into these lists, right? And if you look into it, you're already overwhelmed and you want to close it again because, you know, you see all of these hundred things that you have not yet done. And it's much easier to have some focus on, okay, what can I do tomorrow? I cannot do everything tomorrow. So, you know, what are the most important things that need to get done? So that helps a lot. Start from a clean state and then you can put in uh, what is really important. Um, what also helps if you keep a done list, so if you say, okay, I've done that, then cross it out or, you know, move it down there. And then at the end, you've done everything. Why? History, because then you can save that. And if your manager comes and say, okay, what did you actually do that month? It's very easy to say, okay, just, you know, 
get the output out of all of these duns, and then you know you see it very easily, and then you know a few seconds you just created that log what you have done. And you can do this at the end of the day and think of the next thing that you do tomorrow in the morning. And then in the morning, you don't have to think. You just open up the to-do list, start with the first thing. Super easy to handle. Don't need any fancy uh, application for that. It's just a process of a few things of just keeping your focus. Um, what helps a lot as well is I have this a lot when I work you know, on some super complex code. And then out of nowhere, I get this thought like, oh, I should not forget to do this, right? I don't know where these thoughts come from, and I don't know if you know this, right? but uh, this experience, but then you just want to open up your to-do list and save this thought to not forget it, right? But then if you would open up your to-do list, then immediately you would get distracted, right? Because I open up now, I want to add this to my to-do list, and then I see whether I like it or not, all these hundred of things that have not been done yet, and I get distracted because I read this and actually I want to write code. I don't want to deal with this now. But again, what helps you is well, automation to, you know, to add some script to call something like do this super important thing. And then what I do, I hit enter and it's there and it's gone and it's appended at the end of my to-do list. And I have peace of mind and I can continue working again because I'm not distracted by seeing all of these things. I literally drop it into a box and it goes to somewhere and later on I can look at it at the end of the day. But I have peace of mind and I can focus. So these are just a few things that help me when it comes to managing tasks for not you know, thinking about stuff and solving solutions over and over again. Next principle, principle five, principle of knowing your craft. Especially knowing what you're doing. Sounds obvious, but yes, it will make you more effective to actually know your technology and know how to implement stuff because you will get stuff done faster. And the reason for that is technology gets more and more abstract and more and more complex, but that complexity is usually hidden in abstraction, right? So in order to write an enterprise application that does stuff with HTTP and JSON and databases, it's super easy right now with the frameworks, right? You write a Java class, you uh, sprinkle some annotations on it, and then it's suddenly an HTTP endpoint and write something to a database. You don't have to write a lot of code, right? Some Java class with a few annotations and done. But you have to know which annotations you put in there. And it's much more knowledge that you just have to know what you do. It's not doing much. If you would implement that in assembler, then you know you can code a lot, but it's pretty you know obvious what you have to do. You just read the HTTP specification and read every byte yourself, and I don't know, copy that around so you can handle it. But well, in this case, you have to know what you're doing, how to use framework and technologies. And the obvious thing: read the documentation. No, really, I mean it. How many times did I, you know, try an error or some solution and say, oh, what about if I use this? Oh, it doesn't work. Oh, let me try that. Oh, it doesn't work. And then after two hours, I finally, okay, I give up. I will look into the documentation, right? And then, of course, after 15 minutes of proper reading, I see, oh, it cannot work because, I don't know, I used the concept in a totally different way or I forgot about this and that because I didn't read properly it will make you more effective to properly read and know about a solution and know how to implement it. So that helps a lot. And the opposite of that principle, principle six, is to communicate. To communicate back what you're doing, right? And especially how to use an implementation or how and why you did a certain thing, right? And that means write the documentation. No, really, I mean it. And not only for your co-workers or to be a nice person for everybody else, <laughs> no, for yourself. Because, you know, there's the saying that um, half a year from now, um, code that you wrote half a year ago looks to you like code that somebody else wrote. I think that's not true. I think that's true even after two weeks. <laughs> I have no clue like what I wrote two weeks ago and why. And the reason why I actually started my original blog, um, can have a look there, is for myself just to write down what I learned, you know, this day and what I, how to implement this and that. And I kid you not, more times than I would like to admit, I actually googled for a solution for some problem and I ended up on my own blog with a blog post I wrote two years ago and I'm like, oh yes, I wrote this and I solved this and you know, this is how that worked. And 
it helps you to, you know, just for yourself, what did you write, why, especially why, right, comments that I said in the first talk, why you choose some solution and it will help, well, not only you, but also your co-workers to understand that better. So, this is an important uh, uh, thing to do and in the same way, trying to share knowledge. Share knowledge comes in many, many forums. You can go do some pair programming. You can do an informal uh, brown bag session at your company, at your team to, you know, tell them about a specific solution, tell them about a specific technology, you know, or even write a blog post, write a newsletter, record a video, create a tutorial, do a talk uh, somewhere. Why? It forces you, yourself, to know about something and teaching is the best way of learning yourself because you really have to know what you're doing in order to be able to teach. And if I write some blog posts, I double check and triple check if it's something is actually correct because I write it in the blog post, right? And then you know about things, you check the, the background and the history and you know more how stuff works. And then of course it will make you more knowledgeable and it will make you more effective as a developer as well. So in hindsight here are six of the seven productivity uh, principles again. So automation, using the computer in the correct way, trying to focus and eliminate context switches as a human, reflecting what we're doing and whether there's a better way around it, a nice principle of don't make me think twice, and these principles of knowing what you're doing, of reading and consuming documentation as well as sharing documentation and knowledge in order to become more knowledgeable as a, product, uh, as a programmer. And then the seventh productivity principle, that is a little bit counterintuitive, that is, use the safe time to relax. That is not very German, but I think it's uh, very important because you know if you do a lot of these principles and then you get more um, effective, more productive, right? And then you have a lot of time that you saved and that you can use to be even more productive, right? To define even more shortcuts and more automation, but this doesn't end well. And especially with you know time that we use to solve complex solution and that we use to think, it requires a lot of energy and it doesn't work to do this eight hours a day even, right? You have to do some breaks. You have to, you know, take a step back. You probably know this, um, how to solve complex solutions. If you're just trying to solve something and it just doesn't work, the best thing is to take a walk, take a nap, go out, eat something. And then when you come back, you probably solve it right now because, you know, you allowed your mind to rest. And this is very, very important um, as well. And even as programmers, there is no substitute for healthy diets for your body, for doing sports, and enough sleep. I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much for your attention. Do you have some more questions? If you follow the first link, you will get to a um, website where I can point you to some more resources. You get, um, I actually recorded some video courses uh, that are available uh, for free, um, how to use your keyboard more effectively. I can show you how to implement these shale aliases and things like that, how Vim works and some other stuff. And uh, another video course on this productivity thing in general with some more examples. So if you're interested in that, you can try that out and, and let me know. Some questions. Yes. Yeah, basically it means, so if you think of, let's do a concrete example, if you think of some Java code, Java Enterprise, where you say at transactional, right, to make some method transactional. And then in the annotation you can say tra transactional required, you know, requires new or requires the existing or, you know, never, whether the um, transactional context, right. So you can control how the transaction manager handles new transactions or, you know, existing one, whether you use a subsequent transaction or, you know, you reuse one that is there, right? Or always create a new one. And to write that is very little code, right? You write one annotation and you change the value of the annotation. So that's trivial. But the, um, the side effect that has is huge, right? So the application will behave differently, the transaction will be there or not. 
And the point is now you have to understand what that means. Right? You have to understand how these transactions are, are handled and things like that. So that makes, uh, that makes a difference to say, okay, to implement that is trivial, but the effect is huge. So you have to know what that small annotation does, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yes, what's behind the annotation? How? Um, um, so I hope you find it, but that's basically transactional. Um, that's what I'm talking about. And then you can say, you know, value transaction required. So this doesn't make sense on a static method. It's just for. And then you know, say, oh, if called outside a transactional context, blah 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 blah. And basically, what that value means, and what it means in a bigger context of your JTA um, and JPA, the persistence. Um, unit in your application, what that means, that is the big you know, difference, whether you put this value or that value. And the point is, it's very trivial to write that code, right? It's like one line of code, and if you change that line of code, you do a lot of different things. So you have to know what that means, what the implementation, uh, what the implication is. That is basically the, the point behind that. Yeah? I have one note about uh, the to-dos. Yeah. I use it to share with colleagues, yes. Um, not for my own private purposes. What I use is actually an application that I wrote myself, yes, I know. And the reason for that is I, for planning, for planning my day, I use another principle that is I use the calendar to also plan my tasks. You might have heard that before. So if you say, why should I use my calendar to put in a super important meeting, you know, to block in an hour for that super important meeting when it's not actually that important, but then the rest is you know, free time. What I do instead, I say, okay, I plan my task time. So when I say, work on this important project, then I say, okay, put in a two hour block out of an actual event into a calendar and reserve it as busy. And then you know, on this two hours, you will work on this project. So this is how I you know, do my task planning. Then and then it will be blocked. Nobody else can put in a meeting because then I'm working on this project because it's important, right? And this is how I do do the planning there, and I do this then every day for for my to-do list, and I basically drag in these tasks into my calendar. And for that reason, I wrote an application where I can literally drag them in and where they have a connection to that. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say that you can uh, put your to-do items just directly to the Google Calendar. Yes. You not only write what to do, but also the time you plan to do it. And, you, and then in, the, in your case, you don't even have a to-do list. You only use your calendar for that, right? Yeah, there, there is a feature in Google Calendar mm -hmm. that there is a checkbox uh, near for you. It yeah. only define the to-do, but also the, the deadline. That's perfect. The reason why I personally don't use that is I want to use also you know, the Vim key binding and have an application where I can you know, use your own shortcuts. So ultimately, that's a long history that's uh, in the last years, but I wrote some application for that. But basically, yeah, same story. If you use that, that's a pretty good solution. Yeah, and my second question is about Wim. Can you just explain once again about the, the power of Wim in terms of uh, increasing typing speed? And yep. this sort of the, the biggest power, I think, is just that you're able to not move your hands, that your hands keep on the home row, F and J, the whole time. And for that, you are overloading basically the keys. And it's the same whether it's Vim or you know, Idea Vim or Shell with Vim emulation or browser with Vim emulation. What you do, um, you know, instead of going there to your cursor for up and down, you just say, okay, F and uh, K and um, L. No, I don't even know it, right? I just type it. Uh, J and K is up and down, right? So, or H and L is left and right. So you don't move your hands, you use the same, you know, you use the fingers with the keys where you are actually there. And then with escape, that's also a good um, example. You can remap caps lock, for example, to escape. And even on a MacBook that doesn't even have an escape key anymore, you have it right there because typically you don't, you know, don't need caps lock that often. You just do this because it's a smaller movement rather than do this for escape. You know what I mean? So that is, I think, the biggest um, benefit of using Vim is to be able uh, to get rid of that context switch of your hand movements. Instead of saying, oh, I have to, you know, even keyboard shortcuts are good, but even uh, if the keyboard shortcut requirement to do this, it's, you know, it's bad for up and down. It's just faster to do it there. So I think that's the biggest improvement there. Yes. I do, I'm sometimes also use the mouse, right? While, while you are browsing, it's just, you know, then the mouse is sometimes more effective. Oh, yeah. Can, can, can you show sure. Google, hello world. Let's do this, and then I say go to um, the first one. 
Oh, that's why doesn't it work for Google? Okay, sorry. And usually it should it should display some overlay like I did here. So for example, then I say you know connect there or resources. So I display this and I say okay connect or um, let's go up and down and you know go to this side and things like that. It depends. Sometimes while I'm using the mouse more, then I just keep using the mouse because it's faster. But what I want to um, get rid of is these, uh, these high frequent contact switches. So I move to the mouse and move back, move to the mouse, move back. And then I say, okay, I can use the mouse to operate it or I can use the keyboard as well. And then, you know, while I'm here, then I can just do it in this way because it's, you know, then faster. I don't have to make that contact switch in this case. But yeah, um, I also explained that in the video course. You know, it's sometimes just a question what you use more. So for example, I use, I kid you not, I use Vim to write emails. Why? It's just faster to use that setup and to use these live templates to, to write something like uh, Dear Sir or Madam, Hello World, Best Regards, Sebastian. Take this and copy paste it into your program, hit enter and you're done, right? It's just faster to do whatever you like in the keyboard and not doing these context switches. So that's, that's why. Yes? Yes, of course. Uh, how, how are this, how is it, it, it text when you try to remember the alias? Or when I try to remember the alias, they're actually easy to find. So shell aliases, I define myself and then I can do, um, there's a command called alias. If you just type it there and then you can grab and search for, for example, everything git. And if I say, oh, I had this, I don't know, git commit before, and then I, sorry, then I can search for it. And then I say, oh yeah, it was GC, I don't know, right? In an IDE, you can do the same. You can say, or uh, for example, it's this, um, yeah, uh, uh, shift, shift. And then you can say action. And then I say, I don't know, refactor, move method or extract method. I don't know. Uh, yeah, and then it will tell you, oh, method is control alt M. It's a little bit small, but you can find it there as well. So finding a, short, um, a shortcut that is already there is typically not this, um, the issue. What I have a lot that I defined a, um, a shortcut and then I never used it because it wasn't that helpful or whatever. But it doesn't matter, right? If you don't use it, you don't use it. And then at some point I look at the list of all my alias and say, oh yeah, by the way, I should use that. But what is much more helpful to say, okay, I need new ones. Uh, what you can do as well to have a look at your Z shell or bash history and then you grab and sort that, sort it by usage and then you know you see the commands that you type all over again and then you should define for the aliases for these. So that is helpful. The other way around if you forget something you know it doesn't matter because if there is a feature that you don't use then it was probably not that helpful or you didn't, you didn't need it that much. Yep. Uh, uh, how for me it's in prefer. Like, either you communicate with the team, either you uh, concentrate. How, how you separate? Like, if somebody in the team has a question. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. These are two different working modes. You cannot do them at the same time. Yes. So you should define productivity windows where you say, okay, in these thirty minutes, sixty minutes, I focus on that, and then you know we communicate. And what helps me a lot is again take a step back and reflect. Over time, I notice more and more what my um, you know, daily patterns are, and especially with the body, what your body energy level looks like. So in the morning, for example, I'm very productive, have a lot of energy, I can solve problems. And then after lunch or in the afternoon, it's like typically like this, I get sleepy, I need some coffee. And that's the best time for meetings, right? When, not that I will fall asleep, but you know, it's, it's not the highest productivity time that you need because you will communicate, it's a different, energy that you use, I guess, um, and then you will notice more and more your patterns when you are the most productive, and then you say, hey, you know, morning 8 to 10 is my high productivity time, I really would appreciate it if we do the meeting afterwards or before or whatever, and so I can, you know, work in that time and then afterwards we can communicate or in the afternoon we can chat about that. So that works for me really well that I say, okay, you know, Communication is important, so don't get me wrong, it's not saying you know you should avoid it or something because it is important to talk, but then it requires a different energy, maybe less concentration, and it's more interactive to say, okay, this is a good mode after you've, uh, you have done something, 
and then you know you can communicate about it afterwards in the afternoon and in the morning is for high productivity working or the other way around or some time windows that work for you so of course it's a different working mode and you have to find a way also you know the size of these windows that work for you and for team for your team yes I know this interferes and that's the best question the best thing you can do is talk to each other and typically everybody who works in our industry knows and understands this. Everybody knows we need to focus and everybody knows these feelings, how it feels if you want to work on something and you get distracted, it's annoying. So they will feel for you and saying, hey, yeah, you're right, I understand it. And then maybe you can come up with a mode where both you know, works. What, what I said before about this, you know, 30 minutes or 60 minutes, then, you, uh, then you know, your coworker doesn't say, hey, hey, it's important now, but your coworker writes you a Slack message knowing that you're not in Slack right now, but then you know, after a while you will get a response and maybe that's a good compromise. Yeah, earplugs or <laughs> yes, no, no, no. Uh, just say, uh, let me think about after five minutes. And commonly, after five minutes, uh, the person who asked you some questions yeah. have already solved the problem yeah. and uh, don't want to ask you again. Yes, that's also a good solution. Yeah. Just say to you, ask me after five minutes. Yes. Same way when people are in vacation, right, and really not available at all, you know, either it wasn't that important or, you know, it's probably solved, right, by, by the time they come back, if they're really not available, yeah. Typically, the world will not end if somebody's not there. Oh, I write a lot of code, yeah. Okay. It's uh, right now a lot of example code, you know, different type of, but I, I code a lot, yes. Um, all kinds of projects. So my background is mostly bound to a specific technology. So I usually use Java and Java Enterprise, but I worked in all kinds of areas, like literally bank, insurances, automotive, I don't know, communication, like bigger uh, companies, small startups. So for me, it's mostly, it's not really an area. It has been all kinds of areas. It's more like a technology that I work with. Yeah. All right. Other question? I work remotely now in my part of my role. Or I'm usually traveling somewhere anyway, so that's also do remotely. But even when I'm at home, I, I have an office at home just because it's more productive for me. Okay. Yeah, then once again. Uh, parts of my team. Uh, well, my team is super, super small. So IBM is huge. It has like 460,000 develop, uh, not developers, employees worldwide, and my team is four um, worldwide. So that's uh, the global dev Java developer advocates that we are called. So you know, for Java advocates globally, so you know, for all kinds of conferences worldwide and all kinds of uh, areas, uh, how to become a part of that is basically a question: how to become a developer advocate is to you know, have fun with basically sharing knowledge. So this is how I explain my, my job is you know, to share knowledge, how to do things, technical things, in you know, writing blog posts, newsletter, creating videos, creating tutorials, or you know, giving workshops or giving presentations. Um, I enjoy really teaching and sharing the, uh, this, this knowledge. And I would say it just comes natural if that is what, what you enjoy. So I started as being a freelancer. I started. Um, being in many, many projects, and then I did more and more um, of these conferences, of these events where you can, you know, go to workshops, where you can create uh, such things, and then, you know, you could just dragged into such roles or offered such, such uh, type of roles. And developer relations uh, gets, you know, bigger and bigger and more important for a lot of companies. So if you're interested in that, you can just, like, um, basically the term is developer advocate or developer relations, and you can have a look, you know, into such roles or into such requirements and do or do such things, I would say. Oh, what does Java Champion mean? That's also a good uh, question. It's a title that is given not by Oracle, actually, what a lot of people think, but by existing Java Champions. It's for people who, I would say, champion Java or who move the Java ecosystem forward, which is typically in technical terms. So it's a lot of people there who are active, you know, who talk at conferences to share knowledge how to use Java or might be, you know, how to use a big and successful, um, how to organize or a big, uh, big and successful Java conference 
or you know, create a Java community, like a big Java user group or something like that, something that moves the platform, the Java language, and you know, the whole Java ecosystem forward in one way. That's how I would describe it. And most people do this by you know, being technical, by sharing a lot of knowledge, mostly you know, for free, by having some, art um, some blog articles, video courses, and stuff like that. That's a typical you know, way of Java jam. And that's what, what I, how I descri would describe it. They are like right now there are 250 or something Java champions worldwide, I think. Out of what we have, I don't know, some 60 million Java developers like that. I don't know the number. Yeah. My version that I use. Um, I recently switched to Java 13. Um, in most projects, it's still Java 8. And then for the runtime, it depends because uh, the, the latest Java versions don't have many big feature gaps, right? So sometimes you can use like list off or you know var or something like this, right? It's not a or a switch statement or something like that. You can um, there are not many new features. It's more about the runtime, so it depends on the project that this uses. But I try to keep it very you know up to date with the Java version I, I use at least. And once you get past nine, it's actually easy to update. So if you say you know whether you use eleven or thirteen, it's not a big jump. Who of you uses Java 13 in production? <laughs> okay, I would say thank you. Um, I, I did have the um, example with, yeah, you know, just this, uh, this package uh, hierarchy. Um, if you Google for screaming architecture, then you end up um, at an article by Martin Fowler. You can have a look at, at that. I think that shows a little bit more examples also with, uh, with the architecture, you know, like uh, what I said, apartments or event hall and things like that. I think that's a very descriptive um, example. That's, that's why I like it. Okay, then thank you very much, Basibu Bolshoi, for your attention.